Gracious Heavenly Father, I come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very, very grateful for the opportunity that you give us to come together and study your word, to feast upon it. I thank you, dear Lord, for your endless grace and your love that you have for all of us. I ask that you would filter out all of the foolishness but seal to our hearts truth and only truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve again at blessedhopeforever.com. We've been studying together in the book of Ruth. I like to say verse by verse, but it's more like section by section. I won't bother reviewing the first two chapters. Most of you are now familiar with what's occurred so far. Ruth's actions here, uh, as opposed to Orpah's, and I'm, I'm just assuming that I'm speaking to those of you who have followed through and, and watched the past four videos. The actions by Ruth can be viewed, they could be very well viewed as, as works, salvation. And it often is. There's only one problem with that. And that is that it contradicts the rest of Scripture. You know, if only we would do what Ruth did, not what Orpah did. And those who take that approach to this fail to, to see the grace, the sovereignty, and the direction of God in the lives of these people. And the same is true in our lives. Naomi can be seen as Israel, driven back into the land, but I believe that she can also be viewed in some sections of this study as the Holy Spirit leading and directing Ruth and being concerned about her welfare. That's, that's kind of what makes this a little tough to understand sometimes. I pointed out that I don't have any problem with any uh, interpretation that people have of, of any of this as far as the symbolic re representations as long as it doesn't contradict Scripture. So we, we see this in Naomi directing Ruth into a union with Boaz. And we see in Boaz, we see a picture of fellowship between the Lord's people and Himself. Now, it's always bothered me that we, we don't see any blood sacrifice in this book, but we do see redemption in the picture of a price being paid. Redemption meaning a ransom has been paid. We see in the text both the word kinsman and the word redeemer. And so I, I believe that we are looking at the idea of a kinsman redeemer. Now here, Ruth uses the word relative. We're going to begin looking at chapter 3 here, and he, it's not, not the word kinsman redeemer. Relative. The word is relative. Now surely Naomi would have known that there is a closer relative than Boaz. You know, the question in my mind was, as well as, as I'm sure in many others, is why didn't she send Ruth to this closer relative to begin with? So surely she would have known that. So we have a, a kinsman redeemer that's closer than Boaz. She uses the word relative. Why didn't she send Ruth there? Did she think Boaz was, you know, more handsome, more wealthy, you know, or what? You know, we don't know. The fact is, we just don't know. God did not tell us. But I'm going to try to, to crowd all this together before we end the book. We do know, because we can read ahead, that there is another, another kinsman redeemer. And that's bothered a lot of people down, I'm sure, down through the centuries who have studied the book of Ruth. She says, 
that uh, Boaz is a relative, but there's a closer relative. She says that you've been working with, she says to Ruth, you've been working with his handmaidens. And, and that Hebrewism indicates that she's been elevated from the position of poverty to membership in Boaz's clan. You can't do anything with the third verse to, except see that Ruth is alluring and attractive. She even smells good. You know, so you could well build a sermon on that. Uh, you know, that's we've got to make ourselves attractive. We've got to make ourselves smell good. You know, to do, do you, you see what I'm saying? You can almost assume anything from the text. You know, depending on your theology, it's it is. That's how you're going to approach these verses, folks. Okay? This is why so many people will have come out of Ruth having a different interpretation of what occurred and what the application is for their lives. So you could well build a sermon on that. But one could also preach on the fact that God has so blessed us that we are desirable to the Lord, that we are attractive, that we are sweet-smelling, we are a sweet-smelling fragrance to the Lord. That's what I pointed out in a previous video. Mainly because He loves us and we are His. No other reason than that. You don't need any other reason than that. If you're searching for a reason as to why God loves you, why God has accepted you, well, you, you can stop that, that uh, futile uh, exercise. He loves you because you're His. And I don't think that you can say that Ruth engineered any of this. Or that Naomi engineered any of this. Or, or anyone else. Or that Boaz engineered any of this. God works in us both to will. We know that He works in us both to will and to do of His good pleasure. And that to me is the picture of the third verse. Ruth chapter 3, verse 3. So now we see Ruth arriving at, the, at the, the floor, the winnowing floor, making sure that she's not known, watching where Boaz lies down, after doing what Naomi said for her to do, following through on Naomi's instructions, where Boaz lies down after eating and drinking, because, you know, by now he's tired. And some go to great lengths here explaining how that what Boaz drank, well, it could not have been alcoholic, but, but I mean, you know, they didn't have refrigerators back then. They didn't have freezers back then. If, if it was grape juice, I guarantee you, it wasn't grape juice for very long. And the text says that he was happy. And he's going to lie down in a deep sleep. And she's to mark very carefully where that is. She's to mark, get this, Ruth is to take note of where he lies down. Now, I don't think I'm pushing the text by suggesting that we are to take note, okay, of the crucifixion of Christ here. I pointed out that I believe that that deep sleep, that darkness, and and Boaz going to sleep was a picture of our Lord's crucifixion. And Ruth is, well, she used to mark very carefully where that is. It is the Holy Spirit who is directing Ruth to Christ. It isn't Ruth who comes to Christ. She's to uncover his feet and lie down. That is, rest. Okay, rest. And he will tell her what she is to do, says Naomi, which I, I believe here is a picture of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, okay, tells me and you 
to come and rest, okay, in Christ. And the Holy Spirit will tell us what we're to do. And there's all kinds of arguments and questions about verse 4. You know, how much of his feet did she uncover? How close did she lie next to him? You know, all of which the text does not answer. What I will suggest about this is that the Holy Spirit has left that unanswered, and that I believe for very good reasons. One, I believe being that our intimacy with Christ is very, very personal. You have a name written that no one knows but the Lord. If you were, you know, if you if you were young, if you are young, you know, and you don't know very much, and you're looking for answers about romance, and and you came asking me intimate questions about me and my wife, I wouldn't answer any of them. You know, for several reasons. One being that when it comes to understanding women, I don't really know very much. But another being that, but that's between me and my wife. It's personal. I believe that that is an intimate relationship that a couple learns together. And so that's why I think that the Holy Spirit has purposely, intentionally left this blank. However, we'll see in the text that Ruth did propose marriage. I believe she proposed marriage. The word there, afraid, means to quake about, to be startled, to tremble. So it could be that she uncovered his feet to gently awake him, or that he was afraid. But I have to admit that the expression is used of intimate relations between a man and a woman. And she's to lay down there, and he'll tell you what to do. Now, how can Naomi know that? How could you have known that? How does she know that, that he isn't going to just tell her to get lost or any other number of things? And again, I believe this is not Ruth engineering this, but that Naomi here is a type of the Holy Spirit directing her to Boaz. He will tell you what to do. There's no question about it. It isn't that, well, he might do that or we, we you know, or we hope he does. And Ruth said to Naomi, All that thou sayest unto me I will do. And the word sayest is the Hebrew word for command. All that you command me to do, I will do. I will do. I believe that's a picture of the new creation. The sinless new creation. I'll just throw that out there. Boaz's mother's name, and many of you probably know, was Rahab. You know, do you suppose Naomi knew that? I don't know. We have, we have another interesting genealogy at the end of this book. Rahab, also being said to be the mother of Boaz in Matthew chapter 1. You know, there are only being four women in the genealogy of Christ in Matthew 1. All four seen here. Uh, well, no, not all four are seen here in Ruth, but you know, but all four are seen in Matthew one. All four of them being Gentile. Now I believe there's more than just history here. There's design, the the interweaving of the Jew and the Greek. You know, the Gentile and the Jew. Boaz is our relative. And all that you command me to do, I'll do. And I believe that's a picture of the new creation. A good argument for this being more of a picture of fellowship than a picture of redemption. She went down to the floor, verse 6, and did all according to, uh, you know, all. That word according did exactly all that her mother-in-law told her to do. I have to look, at, I have to see that as, as, you know, the sinless new creation because that's what the new man does. 
The new man cannot sin. You know, and many of you out there who are familiar with the Greek, and I know we're looking at Hebrew here, but you know, the Greek which applies to us um, more particularly, you know, there's there's the word practice in the New Testament. Practice, that's the word proso. Okay? And then there's the word poieo, do. I tend to look at practice as the word practice is referring to all the flesh, the old man, the works of the flesh. Whereas poieo, do, has more to do with the new man. In, in our conflict between flesh and spirit, you know, I believe we often mar the image of the spirit. The new man cannot sin, says John. But believers, particularly today, they often view the sinless new creation as being that which sins when Scripture clearly says that it doesn't. It's not I who sins, Paul said, but sin which dwells in me. So I believe the new creation does all that Naomi said to do. We don't. The works of the flesh are, are manifest; they're evident, and I won't go down through the list, but you know what those are. And, and we—that's what the old man does: is it practices those characteristics of the flesh. In fact, the flesh gets worse and worse. It does nothing but get better. If you're trying to clean up the old man. I got news for you. Here's a news flash for you. You never will be able to do that. And not only will you not be able to do that, God is not cleaning up the old man in your life. This is all about, uh, behold, all things have become new. We become new creations in Christ. We've received a new nature that is sinless, which He has joined Himself to in our inner man. And there's where all the activity takes place. Everything outside that is not of Him. And we are to reckon ourselves dead to sin, but alive unto God in Jesus Christ our Lord, Romans 6, 11. And now I'm getting off into more particulars concerning our walk and our relationship and, and you know what people often refer to as progressive sanctification. And, I'm, and I don't intend to stray from the text here. But I'm just saying that in the text, I can see Ruth's sinless new creation doing everything that the Holy Spirit, that is Naomi here, is directing her to do. I absolutely believe that our new creation is the righteousness of God in Christ. The new creation does exactly what it is led by the Holy Spirit to do. That's all it can do. All of that which is listed as the works of the flesh a Christian can do. You and I can do that junk. We can take the old man for a ride. But the Spirit is love, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, etc. You know, the, you know or should know all of that. Galatians 5. But I don't believe that we do, D-O, do the works of the flesh. It's the fruit of the Spirit. And I've talked about this difference in many videos. It's the works of the flesh that is manifest, but it's the fruit of the Spirit that is manifest in and through our lives by our Lord Jesus Christ as He lives His life in and through our life. The Spirit works in me, both the will and to do of His good pleasure. And so Ruth did. And so when Boaz was drunk, I don't think you can do anything else with the text, folks. And Mary, happy, which, which result you would expect, he went to lie down in a heap of grain, and she came softly and uncovered his feet and lied down. And that's the end of the paragraph. And it came to pass at midnight, it came to pass at midnight that the man was afraid and turned himself and behold, a woman lay at his feet. It's midnight, okay? It's midnight that the firstborn died in Egypt. 
When Christ died on the cross, there was darkness. Now, maybe here there's a more profound picture than I can put my finger on. As I pointed out, I don't see a blood sacrifice in the book of Ruth, but, but that redemption is also in the paying of a price. Midnight, that's also, uh, that's also when the bridegroom comes in Matthew 25 at midnight. And there's, there must be some reason, well, there, there has to be some reason. Obviously, there's some reason that that's put in the text. That the Hebrew says, Boaz trembled could mean he was frightened. I think it's pushing it too far to see that fear is our Lord's agony in the garden. It's hard not to see judgment in the word midnight. If you look at all the, the other references to midnight, the condemnation of, of the firstborn in Egypt, condemnation when the bridegroom comes. I mean, I, and I, well, I'll, I, but then I also have to admit that on the, on the other hand, condemnation also acknowledges the matter of deliverance. You can't separate the two. So Boaz turns himself, reached around, reached forward, there are both good translations, and behold, wow, a woman laid at his feet. Now, how did he know that? It's midnight, it's dark. You know, whatever fire they had has probably gone out by now. And he said, Who art thou? Who art thou? He said to Ruth, Listen, who art thou? Now, if we look at Boaz as a picture of Christ and Ruth as a, as a picture of the church, which I believe that we're able to do here, then you, you, could, you could look at that as Christ asking you and I, who are we? It's kind of, it reminds me of, of God in the Garden of Eden where he, he, he asked Adam, where art thou? Now, do you honestly believe that, 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 that God asked Adam, where are you, because he didn't know where he was? Of course, of course God knew where Adam was. And I, and I pointed out how that uh, it, it's, it, it's it, at least my understanding that the reason that, that, that God, and, and I, I guess I'm getting off on a rabbit trail, and I really don't want to do that here, It's not that God did not know where Adam was, but it was the, the original Adam, the, the, the Adam that had not sinned, God is pointing out here, he's gone. There's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's now a new Adam that had sinned against God. God no longer saw Adam in the same light as he had before. But, but he asks Adam, where are you? And, and there's no doubt, and there shouldn't be any doubt in any of our minds that God knew where Adam was. Boaz, representing Christ. Ruth, representing the church. We have Boaz asking Ruth, Who art thou? Does God know who we are? Well, of course He does. The question is, is do we? That's the question. So how do we answer that? I believe Boaz knew. It's just my own person. I don't ask anyone to agree with me. I, I, I believe that Boaz knew more than what the text is suggesting. I'm going to suggest two possibilities. One is the scent. She smelled pretty. That's, you know, that's your no man laying there. You know, that's one possibility. We have Scripture that says we are a sweet-smelling fragrance, an odor to Christ. You know, I, that I smell good to the Lord. I, you know, I can't imagine that, but that's what he says. Another possibility being that he knew that it was a woman because of her shape, her size, the, the position in which she was laying, you know, what she was wearing, you know, etc., but bear in mind, it was quite dark. Whatever the case, 
He was astounded. If we consider the word uh, behold, I think in your text it'll say behold. He was astounded. He was astounded that a woman lied, lay, had laid down at his feet. And many scholars suggest Boaz was 80 and Ruth was 40. I don't uh, know if that's true or not. It's, it's a commonly held consensus among most scholars that those were the age differences. And without getting into the, the meaning of the numbers, uh, if you want to look into that, I think there's, there's some, a lot that's pretty interesting about that, 80 and 40. 40 being representing a period of testing, 80 representing something much more interesting here. But I'm going to skip over that for now. Now, just the fact of the age difference, to me, that would be enough to astound Boaz. And he said, who art thou? You know, uh, we see that phrase elsewhere. In the New Testament, the Pharisees asked that. Here, here's the interesting part, is that they asked that of Jesus. Who art thou? Paul asked this as well of Jesus. Uh, you know, who are you? Who art thou? And here we see the reverse Boaz asking this of Ruth. So that's an expression that occurs several times in the Old Testament. It's already, it's already occurred in Ruth once where he asked, you know, who she was, where the foreman said, you know, Ruth the Moabitess. Uh, she doesn't say, note that she doesn't say Moabitess here. She's now being asked to identify herself, and she says, I am Ruth thy handmaid. Okay. All right, not Ruth the Moabitess. Do you get that? Before it was Ruth the Moabitess. Here she says, I am Ruth, one who is fully qualified for marriage. Therefore, put your skirt over your handmaid. She used the word handmaid twice. Twice she uses the word handmaid. Put your skirt over your handmaid, for I am your handmaid. For thou art a kinsman redeemer. Now, there are some who say that Ruth went beyond what Naomi told her to do, that Naomi didn't say to do this. What she said was that when he wakes up, he'll tell you what to do. So there are those who say, well, you know, here's a, pic here's a picture of the fact that Ruth went beyond what the Holy Spirit directed her to do. You know, and God, does, God helps those who help themselves. I heard that from my cousin, Dag, back in Bible college. I couldn't tell him how, much, how wrong he was about that. Naomi didn't tell her to do this. Or did she? You know, I mean, I'm not sure. Naomi didn't tell her to do this. I don't know. I'm persuaded that we are directed by the Holy Spirit and it is God who is working in us both the will and the do of His good pleasure. And now I'm faced with the fact that she calls Him a kinsman redeemer which involves a paying of a price. And he said, blessed. The word blessed there. The word fortunate is the best translation, I believe. Fortunate are you of the Lord. Fortunate are you, my daughter. And now we're getting more intimate. Much more intimate. So they're becoming closer. And Boaz says, For thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning. More kindness now than before. To me, that, to me that's saying, You're giving up all these handsome young guys for me. You know, regardless of whether they're rich or poor, regardless of who they are, and you are not following them. You're not following them. Just give some thought to the word there, follow. Because that's what the verse says. Now the inference is clearly that there's nothing more attractive to Ruth than Boaz. You can't see anything other than that. That's why I have to see this as the new creation. It's the flesh that lusts after worldly desires. And, and remember, Boaz, however old he is, he's got to be old.
Could be that Ruth doesn't really know if Boaz can produce children. You know, why would Ruth desire Boaz? We all know how exciting that those days of our youth were, but she chooses Boaz, who is basically inferring that those younger women were more attractive than he was. That's what the text says. And so I have to come to, to the conclusion that it is, we're looking at the direction of the Holy Spirit that makes Boaz attractive to Ruth. No man, we know that no man seeks after God, Romans 3.11. The text says, Ruth did not follow that which would be naturally attractive to her. And so he calls her again his daughter. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. Which reminds me a lot of let not your heart be troubled. Peace, my peace, I give unto you, not as the world gives, I, our Lord said. I will do to thee all that's necessary. What marvelous grace. Whether it's a picture of redemption or fellowship, which, which I believe it is, or perhaps it's both, I don't see how you can do anything but rejoice, folks, over the fact that Boaz says, I will do to thee all that thou requirest, all that's necessary. And she doesn't have to do a thing. She doesn't have to do anything. For all the city of my people, why doesn't she have to do anything? Don't miss this. For all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. And we have been made the righteousness of God in Christ. And my heart aches, folks, for the millions upon millions of believers who don't know that. I don't stand before God any, any righteous than, than you or vice versa. We've been made the very righteousness of God in Christ. Oh, dearly beloved, do you understand that? Do you know that? Is your life based on that? Do you live your life based upon that fact, that truth? But think of what you could also do with that statement. Thou art a virtuous woman. Well, that means what that means is that, that, that means that only good people can come to Christ. When we know, first of all, that God has removed Adam's transgression in Christ and that He died in our place in the eternal counsels of God, and the ones who are coming to Christ are the ones whom He has redeemed, I think that in looking at Naomi as Israel, she's going to be redeemed, whereas Ruth is in an intimate inseparable union and fellowship with Boaz. I'm going to do it all, he says to Ruth. I'm going to do everything that is necessary for you because you are holy, a virtuous woman. Now We're, we're coming up on a a section of the, of the study here, a portion of the text here that deals with a nearer kinsman, one who was a nearer relative than Boaz. And that's troubled a lot, a lot of people, including myself. I hope that you'll stay, uh, stay along with us, continue along with us into this study to, because I think what you're going to see in this near relative is, is something uh, quite astounding. Well, I'm out of time. I love you all. I truly do. I want to thank you for all of your continued prayers and for the direction of this ministry, all of your kind comments that you leave me. I thank you deep. I, 
I, I, I don't have words to express just how grateful that I am for the number of views that the, the, these videos are getting and for how that you've said that these videos have helped uh, you in your study of God's Word. I thank you for all of your love, your kindness, your words of encouragement, your support. Until next time, stay safe. This is Steve. Thanks for watching.